On February 13, 2022, my family lost its member. Her name was Fenia, and she was our little dog. Our best friend and, of course, a part of our family for almost 19 years. I want to dedicate this video to her and to my parents who took care after her when I left Russia and who hold her in their hands when she fell asleep. I also have to acknowledge that I make this video during the uncertain time for Ukraine, Russia and the whole world. I hope I'll have um, another opportunity to express my solidarity to the victims of the war, maybe in another video. And I do really want to use this chance to contemplate on what really matters, on how we all deserve happiness, love and friendship. Thanks for being here and, well, let's begin. The human-dog relationship is one of the most long-lasting alliances in our history. We live, eat, hunt, sleep, travel, and work together. In some cultures, dog was a deity. Some made them protect their houses from the intruders. In more modern times, dogs contributed to the development of science and space exploration. Of course, we couldn't help but represent them in our art. However, for many artists, to draw a dog was a challenge. We're talking about new anatomy, new poses, and alien to us expressions of feelings. The giants of the art world, such as Jean de la Croix and Leonardo da Vinci, were among many others to study the intricate details of the animal's anatomy. It is believed that the artist John Frederick Lewis and his friend Adam Lancier of whom we're going to talk in detail later, dissected the animals with their own hands when they were young and drew the so-called écorché. People didn't stop there, because apart from the precise anatomical depiction of animals' movement, we needed to understand what our best friends actually feel and how they express their feelings. One of the pioneering researchers in the field of physiology of human and animal feelings was Charles Darwin. In his book The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals, he argues that we tend to underestimate animals' feelings, whilst in their behavior one can clearly distinguish emotions similar to the humans. Indeed, we have not simply learned to appreciate animals' feelings, we can differentiate with certainty between a sad, unwell dog and happy, loving puppy. For an artist, it became hard to trick a viewer and convey an improbable dog. We know our friends best. Or do we actually? I suggest taking a look at the most iconic and striking images of the dogs in art and seeing what we can learn about them or maybe about ourselves. We don't remember how it had started, there are many theories on why we became friends, but let's agree on the fact that the dogs escorted us in so many activities as if we couldn't do that without them. Most often you might find an image of the dog right next to its master. Indeed, capturing one's image together with the pet is an old tradition. You certainly know some of the examples, like this one, or this one. Here I should note that with or without the dog, not everybody could afford the portrait altogether. That's why we often see the members of noble families and bourgeoisie together with their pets. But again, to be fair, not all the artists work exclusively for a commission. Take for instance one of the most important British artists of the past, Thomas Gainsborough, who in his lifetime painted a great number of portraits of the noblemen and noblewomen of the 18th century. This artwork of his, however, doesn't portray a kid of a particularly noble descent. It is believed that the painting was made in a studio based on the pure imagination of the artist. To be convincing, Gainsborough dresses the girl up in tatters, puts the broken jug in one hand and a little puppy in another. And as in many of his paintings, the puppy is not just to show that this or that person possesses a dog. The dog plays a crucial role in reflecting the emotions of the main character. The puppy is as sad and miserable as the girl herself. We tend to see dogs as our animalistic mirror. We find them to have the same habits and sometimes even the same appearance. After the long-lasting tradition of depicting a dog as an accessory to a human, we eventually started to focus on the dog themselves. That, however, didn't completely change our anthropocentric approach. 
The depiction of typical, or I would even say stereotypical, traits of dogs reached its pinnacle in the Romanticism era as a perfect subject of conveying idealized feelings. Take for instance this painting by Wilhelm Trubner called Ave Caesar Morituri to Solitand. The artist depicted his dog named Caesar with a chain of sausages on his snout, demonstrating the great stamina and self-possession of the animal. The title of the painting, which in rough translation means Greetings, Caesar, those who are about to die salute you, adds an extra layer to perception and understanding. It is believed that this way the gladiators greeted the Caesar in the Roman Empire, although there is still no proof of that. In this case it is not clear who is greeted by whom in this painting. The dog named Caesar? Or somebody else is greeted by the dog who is staring at the hanging sausages with the gladiatorial patience. The pupil of artist Hermann Goebel was a witness to the artist working on this painting by drawing from life. The good animal actually sat for him with the sausages as a model. While he was working, he had to go to the studio door because someone knocked. When he came back, the dog sat there, just like before, immobile and stiff, only the sausages had disappeared, without a trace in the short time that had passed. Well, the poor dog is not that patient after all. Fast forward in history, in the 20th century, in the newly developed movement of arts in the Soviet Union called the Soviet Realism, the image of the dog and its loyal character couldn't be avoided either. In this painting, low marks again by the Soviet artist Fyodor Reshetnikov, we see the episode in the life of an ordinary Soviet family in which the son got back from school presumably with poor grades. In contrast to his disappointed mother, judging elder sister and mischievous younger brother, the dog is happy to see its little master. It doesn't care about the grades, successes and failures of the human. It's just happy to see it and put its paws on the familiar chest. The nature of Soviet realism art in general romanticized the life of the ordinary people, but here the artist breaks the rules and shows the struggles of not just one person, but the whole family in raising a responsible citizen. Only the dog is a keeper of the ideal, but again, not because of the Soviet realism tradition, but because we see their loyalty to us and we praise it in them. But wait for it, the depiction of unconditional and absolute loyalty takes a different perspective in the next chapter of this video. When my dog died in such a relatable expression of my feelings, I realized that there is a certain tragedy in our relationships with the dogs. Because our life spans differ and rarely synchronize completely, there is always a moment when one of us is mourning. Despite the fact that in the majority of cases, the one who weeps and laments is a human, artists sometimes choose to depict the scene where the one who is left in grief is a dog. I'm sure you're all familiar with the story of the famous dog named Hachiko. It is a condensed example of a dog's devotion, of that level of loyalty that people would never achieve. The authors of the Futurama animation series decided to introduce their own retelling of the Hachiko story. The main character Fry had found the fossilized dog and had recognized it as one he used to have in the past. Although he had an opportunity to clone it and thus bring it back to life, he decided not to do that because he was convinced the dog had long forgotten him and their friendship. Well, I won't tell you what happens next in this episode, but it is an exceptional instance in media when the character questions the loyalty of a dog, which perhaps tells more about the character himself. We humans, in comparison to dogs, usually lack this feeling. But what's even more strange for us is that we demand this feeling from other living species. In fine art, perhaps the most famous example of the tribute to this trait is The Old Shepherd's Chief Mourner by Sir Edwin Landseer. Truly heartbreaking scene of the dog pressing her chin and chest to the coffin of the master, for some reason left alone in the room, as if somebody who put the body into the coffin gave the dog some time alone with the deceased friend. The main source of light, right above her head, is designed to draw our attention to the unfolding tragedy, the parting of two friends and their last embrace, the one that only dogs can give. The most interesting decision the artist made, in my opinion, is when he put the shepherd's body in a closed coffin, out of our view. 
What we actually see is the dog with the cough and not the dog with the dead person. It is indeed one of the outcomes of death. The symmetry and communication is disrupted and cannot be restored. We are left alone with a friend who will never reply. Interestingly, there are even early examples of this plot, such as one from Italy. Satire mourning over a nymph by the renowned Renaissance painter Piero di Cosimo. The good part of the painting is occupied by the dog with a dropped head watching the lifeless body of a nymph. We could indeed explain the dramatic features of the Sir Lancier's paintings by the nature of the epoch in general, by romanticism and sentimentalism peculiar to that time. But it seems that already in the Renaissance, if not earlier, artists emphasized the inclination of our pets to be compassionate and empathic. It seems as if artists of various periods favored the scenes in which animals demonstrate the utmost fidelity to the humans. Of course, we do appreciate their ability to be loyal. But what if we just cherish the idea that we can be loved and trusted? What if we just want to believe that there is somebody or something in the world that can be by our side, even if we're no longer there? I guess both are right. We love dogs as much as we love the fact that they love us. Maybe, though, the main motivation to pick up this scene and depict it in art is the broken life circle. To lose a dog is tragic. To lose a dog due to one's death is even more dramatic. Yet another prominent artist of the Romantic era, Francisco Goya, for one of his works in a series of black paintings, chose to depict the drowning dog. Surrounded by the west emptiness of just two colors, the dull yellow color as a background, not contrasting but rather deepening the absorbent brown at the bottom, that covers the whole body of the dog, leaving only its head on the surface. Interestingly enough, we don't know for sure if Goya wanted to paint the drowning dog, and since the black paintings were not meant to be exposed publicly, he never gave them the official title. This artwork in particular is usually described as the dog. Some people call it the drowning dog, but it is indeed our assumption that the dog is drowning, not just swimming or playing. Again, it is a very accurate assumption since the rest of the paintings in the series depict the horrors of life on Earth. Some critics and art historians, indeed, interpret the dog as an allegory to the inevitability of death and the tragedy of life in general. But the beauty of art lies, as usual, in the eyes of the beholder. I personally see in this painting the inevitable death of one particular dog. And it is sad. It is tragic. It is devastating. To think that nothing might help in the death of a little creature is frightening and disruptive. Exactly 150 years passed since the publication of Darwin's book on human and animal emotions. Throughout this time, our perception of animals, and specifically our pets, has evolved into a deeper understanding of our relationship. In fact, we realized that all this time we had a very anthropocentric view of other living creatures. In other words, we never really tried to see what they see, to think what they think and feel what they might feel. But that has changed during the shifting time of the 20th century. While mourning the death of her friend Lily, American contemporary artist Katie High created a video consisting of the footage of her beloved dog and the voiceover expressing the thoughts of her dog. The voice that represents the dog is fully aware of the outcome, of the inevitable destiny. The title of the artwork, Lily Does Derrida, states clearly, the reasoning of the dog is based on the works of the famous French philosopher of the past century, Jacques Derrida. The methodology of deconstruction developed by Derrida left the door open to reconsider many things in our life. Eventually, Derrida also gained fame as a philosopher of death after publishing his book The Work of Mourning in 2003. A few years later, he introduces another publication, The Animal That Therefore I Am. The dog in the video quotes this book. She emphasizes how Derrida encouraged people to think of animals not just as a group of creatures, but as individuals. He poses questions such as, does the animal dream? Does the animal think? Does the animal produce representations? A self, imagination, a relation to the future as such? Does the animal have not only signs, but a language? And what language? Does the animal die? Does it laugh? Does it cry? Does it grieve? Does it get bored? Does it lie? 
Does it forgive? Does it sing? Does it invent? Does it invent music? Does it play music? Does it play? Does it offer hospitality? Does it offer? Does it give? Does it have hands, eyes, etc., modesty, clothes, and the mirror? Well, to be honest, we ask ourselves the same questions when we think of ourselves. And as for his other book I mentioned, The Work of Mourning, though it was dedicated to the deceased friends and colleagues, it speaks about the phenomenon of grief when losing the loved ones. For Derrida, there is a paradox in friendship between two people. One friend must die before the other, and we never know which one is that. And in case of animal friends, however, the chances are we will outlive them, and most probably we will witness their death, and we have to learn how to deal with our grief. We can interpret our shared history with the dogs in many different ways. Some contemporary philosophers uh, switch to more radical movements uh, of abandoning the exploitation of the animals altogether, including their domestication. And although the relationship between the animal and the human probably hasn't changed much, uh, the perception has, as well as the representation of animals in art. Yes, we still live, eat, hunt, sleep, travel and work together, but we also reflect on how our beloved pets change us, how they make us better and more tolerant. We do think about our place in this relationship, but we are capable of simply love them and to dedicate art not for the sake of finding our own place, but to express pure love to our friends. Take for instance David Hockney in his famous series of paintings of his two Dutch hoons. I wanted desperately to paint something loving. I felt such a loss of love, I wanted to deal with it in some way. I realized I was painting my best friends, Stanley and Bougies. They sleep with me. I'm always with them here. They don't go anywhere without me, and only occasionally do I leave them. They're like little people to me. The subject wasn't dogs, but my love of the little creatures. And this is what we all do. We love them, therefore we depict them. We depict them therefore they exist forever. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you'll come back soon. Bye!